In 1982, a California Highway Patrol officer pulled a young woman over for speeding. He bullied her into sex and then killed her. He then used a decade of police experience to try to cover up his crime and convince local investigators of his innocence. But would he get away with it? Society depends on trust and authority. It's a system that works. And because it works, we hardly think about it. A uniformed officer demands respect, and we willingly comply. But what if that trust were betrayed? What if a police officer abuses his authority? George Gwaltney was one such cop. The popular and decorated California Highway Patrol officer committed the ultimate violation. He murdered. I'm Jim Kalstrom former director of the FBI's New York office. When good cops go bad, the full power of law enforcement rallies to repair the damage, rebuild the trust, and deliver justice. The Gwaltney case taxed the resources of both state police and the FBI. He was a cunning adversary, trained in crime solving, and he knew how to cover his tracks. 23-year-old Robin Bishop had left her home in Las Vegas to visit a friend in Los Angeles. But then you gotta carry trays, so you gotta work on your arms. Robin had hopes of becoming an actress. Her friend convinced her that if she was serious about acting, she had to move to L.A. Okay, let's see. Robin headed back to Vegas to pack up and make the move. She was excited about her future. In Barstow, California, she stopped to call her mother and get a sandwich. Returning to her car, she fell under the gaze of a predator, California Highway Patrolman George Waltney. Though he was a highly respected officer and member of the community, Waltney had a secret history of stopping women for speeding and then soliciting them for sex in exchange for getting out of a ticket. The night of January 11, 1982, was no different. He quickly memorized the make and model of her car. He also noticed the Nevada license plate. <coughs> Next, Waltney saw a neighborhood boy he knew, a boy who, if necessary, could be used as a convenient alibi. Hey, Preston, you want a ride? Sure. He picked up Preston Olson and gave him a ride home. A former winner of the Officer of the Year Award, Waltney was well known for such kind actions. Barstow parents trusted Gwaltney to keep a protective eye on their children. He dropped Preston off at his house and said hello to his parents. By now, the young woman whom Gwaltney had targeted would be well out of town, headed toward Nevada on Interstate 15. The ordinarily well-traveled highway was unusually quiet. He caught up with her on the empty highway east of Barstow. He turned on his light and siren and pulled her over. Robin Bishop had a string of tickets for speeding. She had in fact just finished a year of probation and had been given a warning that another ticket would cost her her license. Robin knew that a car and a driver's license would be essential for an aspiring actress in Los Angeles. how fast you're going. Pretty bad. It's a little bit too fast. I'm going to have to ask for your license, man. Right. Okay, Robin, I'm going to have to ask you to get out of the vehicle and uh, follow me back to my car. She left the keys hey, in the Robin. ignition and her purse in the car. Let's, uh, 
Robin was probably surprised to be taken back to the patrol car, but she obeyed. Unfortunately, Waltney had more than a speeding ticket in mind. Uh, go ahead and turn around for chance on your head. I'm going to have to tough it. Kick in. For speeding? Yep. That's, that's the law. I was just speeding. Waltney stood her up against the patrol car and handcuffed her. Seat. She must have been scared and confused. Why the handcuffs? Where was he taking her? Waltney returned to her car to get her purse. At that moment, a car with a lone driver passed by. Waltney retrieved the purse, returned to his car, and pulled away, leaving her car abandoned on the interstate shoulder. He drove Robin to an exit that led to a seldom used access road running parallel to the highway. It was a place he often went to take a break during his patrol shift a secluded lookout point where he could observe the highway some 400 feet away, clearly from all directions. There, holding the threat of jail or loss of license over her, Gwaltney raped Robin Bishop. When he was done with her, he radioed in a wants and warrants check on Robin's car as if it were abandoned. He knew he'd been spotted walking towards Robin's empty car. Yeah, I'd like to uh, report a 2829. Yeah, license number 561 FBD. It was the first in a long line of lies covering his actions for the official record. Copy that. after and was simply going to let her go. But as she sat on the ground to put on her boots, something happened. Perhaps anger replaced fear now that she was released. Perhaps she threatened him with exposure. Her brother was a prosecutor in Nevada. Regardless, it would be her word against his. But then, as he stood next to his vehicle, he was suddenly caught in the spotlight of a passing deputy sheriff's car. The deputy may well have noticed Waltney's patrol car from the highway nearby. Waltney could not know whether he had been recognized. Suddenly, Robin's threats became more real. How could he explain being out there on the access road? In a moment of panic, Officer George Waltney decided Robin had to be silenced. Waltney took a final and irrevocable step. Now, there was no way to distance himself from the dead girl. Frantic, he devised a way out. He called the dispatcher and reported finding a dead body, a possible suicide. Knowing he had only moments before other officers would arrive at the scene, he searched under her head for the bullet that had killed her. As evidence, the bullet had the power to destroy him. But there was no exit wound. Homicide detective Milt Rose of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department was sent to investigate the dead body found by Gwaltney. On his way to the crime scene, the dispatcher asked that he examine the abandoned car. 
as the body had been found a short distance away on the access road and was visible to investigators already at the crime scene. The police suspected there was a connection between the car and the body. I did not see any obvious signs of any malfunctions, no mechanical breakdowns. The tires were all in good condition. Uh, the vehicle was uh, in gear. The keys were inside the vehicle. Why did the vehicle stop at the location it was at? At the crime scene, Officer Waltney was now composed and professional. He described how he found the victim, checked for a pulse, and looked in her purse for identification. The Nevada vehicle registration and driver's license identified her as Robin Bishop, owner of the abandoned car he had called in earlier. Although Officer Gwaltney had reported an apparent suicide, Detective Rose quickly ruled out that possibility. The victim had been shot in the back of the head at close range, then moved slightly. Four inches from her head was a stream of blood on the ground. Clearly, this was a homicide. Recent rainfall made tracks and footprints from Gwaltney and his cruiser clearly visible in the damp sand. In this general area, we found uh couple of footprints that came around, the, appeared to come around the front of the vehicle. They travel around in the front of the vehicle and off in a direction sort of towards the middle area of the vehicle. We travel over here into an area about where this bush is located or right in this general area. And that's where Robin Bishop's body was found. The other footprints that we found were leading from the driver's door on the highway patrol unit to the area towards the front of the vehicle and then over towards Robin's body, kind of facing off in the easterly direction. The first officer arriving on the scene criticized Waltney for the profusion of his footprints, a clear contamination of the crime scene and uncharacteristically sloppy Further examination, I noticed what appeared to be marks on her wrist. The marks were familiar to any police officer. Two thin marks across the top of her wrist and one across the bottom, typical of those made by handcuffs. Then when Detective Rose examined the contents of the victim's purse, he could find no signs of robbery, but the vehicle registration and driver's license were lying on top of the purse's contents as if they'd been shown to someone and quickly thrown back into the purse. It indicated to me that we needed to take a look at some type of vehicle stop or somebody in some type of position of authority possibly stopped this car. To Rose, the evidence pointed to the involvement of a police officer or someone posing as one. Every investigator at the crime scene was either a friend or a colleague of Officer Gwaltney. That he might be connected with the crime was not even considered at this point. An autopsy was performed. The results confirmed that the body had been moved slightly after being shot and that the bruises were in fact made by handcuffs. The fatal bullet was found lodged in Robin's jaw. Though it was the caliber of a standard police service revolver, the brand was not the standard ammunition. The autopsy also showed that she had had sex within 24 hours of her death, but there were none of the normal physical signs of a forcible rape. The first thing we needed to do was to eliminate people that had been to the scene or could have been in the area. Uh, other highway patrol officers, other deputies, whoever was in that particular area around that time frame. We needed to start with uh, Officer Gwaltney to begin with because Officer Gwaltney was a person who found the body. Gwaltney's survival depended on staying one step ahead of the investigation. When he finished his shift that night, he struggled to remove the gun barrel from the murder weapon. It was the one piece of hard evidence that could conclusively implicate him in the crime. Gwaltney knew his gun barrel left identifiable markings on the bullet that killed Robin Bishop. The next morning, he went to a local gun shop to order a new barrel, which would confuse a ballistics test. But the barrel was not in stock and had to be ordered. Then he took his uniform to the dry cleaner 
and his holster to the repair shop for re-dyeing and re-stitching. All that remained was to stall for time until the gun barrel arrived. In Barstow, Rose held a briefing that morning with the police and sheriff departments to discuss the case. He asked all officers on duty the night before to turn in their weapons so that ballistics tests could eliminate them as possible suspects in the crime. Gwaltney made sure to attend. During the briefing, he learned that the fatal bullet had been recovered. By early evening, Gwaltney was the only officer who had not turned in his weapon for testing. The detectives went to his home and asked for his service revolver. He returned moments later with the wrong gun, his off-duty weapon. George, this isn't your service revolver, and that's what we need. Oh, that's service. Everyone else the captain sent him back for his service revolver, but he returned empty-handed. You aren't going to believe this, but it, uh, it's been stolen. What do you mean stolen? Stolen. Well, George, there's been some burglaries in the neighborhood. He claimed that his house must have been burglarized. The gun was missing. Have to ask for your... The story sounded doubtful, but because Gwaltney was a highway patrol officer, uh, Detective Brian English with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department was inclined to believe him. I kind of empathized with him because we were, in my opinion, we were looking for evidence to show that he didn't do it. It was some criminal that did it. You know. Gwaltney agreed to come to headquarters for questioning. But first, the detective searched his locker for the missing weapon. They found nothing. Then we sat down and we started talking with Officer Gwaltney. And to him, it didn't appear important that his gun was gone, which was very significant. And if, if I was in his position, I'd been extremely worried, and it didn't seem to bother him. By now, it was almost two days after the crime. The missing weapon and Gwaltney's odd behavior made it impossible to deny the obvious. Gwaltney was advised of his constitutional rights. Although this made him the primary suspect in the case, there was insufficient evidence to actually arrest him. Insisting he was innocent, Gwaltney agreed to give a tape-recorded interview. Yeah, I have no problem with that. He said he'd worked his regular beat patrolling the interstate on January 11th. After his dinner break, he had picked up a young boy he knew, Preston Olson, whom he had seen walking home alone. After dropping Preston off at his house, he was by 8.50 p.m. back on the interstate. About 9.15, he found the abandoned car, ran a stolen vehicle check, then turned onto the access road. Seeing a pale shape he had pulled over, it was the body of the victim, Robin Bishop. He was not reacting normally for a person who had been accused of committing this kind of a crime. Had it been me, I would not be talking to them. I'd tell them to prove it. I'd be very irate. I'd be very upset. Officer Gwaltney had repeatedly insisted on taking a lie detector test. He reiterated his statement and then answered a series of critical questions, including the direct question, had he killed Robin Bishop? No. The examiner could find no sign of deception in the polygraph exam. Gwaltney had just crossed another hurdle in his cover-up. We transported George from the Barstow station back down to San Bernardino for, for the questioning. At that time, uh, George gave his consent to go ahead and search his house. Sheriff's deputies investigated Gwaltney's claim that his house must have been burglarized, but they could find no sign of forced entry. The homicide detectives then began their work. At dawn, they found the frame of a Smith & Wesson Model 19 357 Magnum revolver inside Gwaltney's truck. The frame was badly damaged with tool marks. It appeared to have been dismantled by someone who had no knowledge of how to take it apart. The barrel, which would have been used for a ballistics comparison, was gone. Therefore, there's no ballistics match could be done. The gun frame was registered to George Michael Gwaltney. To the detectives, it had been dismantled for only one purpose. Gwaltney was placed under arrest. 
but the evidence was still only circumstantial. A link between the revolver and the tools used to dismantle it had to be found. The detectives returned to Gwaltney's home for another search. Evidence was collected. Gripping type tools and a pipe vise found behind the garage that showed fresh signs of metal transfer. In the bedroom closet, detectives found five boxes of bullets bearing the CHP insignia. In the boxes among the standard police rounds, they found 27 bullets of another brand. 357 caliber, 158 grain soft points made by Remington Arms, the same kind of bullet that killed Robin Bishop. Gwaltney's wife was in a state of shock and disbelief. When questioned, she assured the detectives again and again that George had not been acting strangely or in any way different lately. He was a good husband and a good father to their children. He's a wonderful husband, a very caring father. News of Gwaltney's arrest stunned the small community of Barstow. His fellow officers had known and respected him for decades. Despite the considerable evidence against Gwaltney, they were unable to accept his possible guilt. Pretty dramatic and emotional uh, thing when uh, another law enforcement officer uh, is accused of committing a murder. Most of the people knew George, and they could not believe that George Gwaltney could have done something so bad. I recall a couple of the officers that were close friends of his were in tears when I was interviewing them because they didn't want to believe that George could do this. Even the investigators struggled to come to grips with the conclusion they had been forced to draw. I would, my feeling was, he didn't do it. He couldn't do it. He's a highway patrolman. But the evidence continued to mount. Semen was found in the backseat of Gwaltney's cruiser and in Robin's jeans. A critical report was filed by Sheriff's Deputy Roger Kaufman who had been out of town the days following the crime and had only just learned of Gwaltney's arrest. He described driving by the exact crime scene area about the time of the murder. From the interstate, he spotted a car's parking lights on the little used access road. Shining his spotlight on the car, he saw an officer standing by it, but was driving too fast to identify him. Barely minutes later, he heard a very upset Gwaltney calling in a possible suicide on the radio. He'd been surprised to hear Gwaltney, a man known for his unshakable presence, sounding so agitated, but had not given the incident any thought until he learned of the arrest. As the investigation progressed, it became apparent that Gwaltney had used his knowledge of investigative procedure to thwart detectives' efforts to collect evidence against him. His uniform had been dry cleaned, his holster re-dyed and re-stitched, allegedly for an upcoming inspection. Any evidence of blood or tissue transferred from the gun had been destroyed. His footprints had altered the crime scene. When detectives questioned the owners of gun stores in the area, on the theory Gwaltney would have tried to buy a replacement barrel for his service revolver, none could recall him being in their stores. After several months of an internal investigation, Gwaltney was fired from the California Highway Patrol. Okay, bye. Now convinced that he had committed the worst imaginable crime, detectives were still unable to prove Gwaltney was lying. His wife and friends still solidly supported him. Nine months later, the trial began, with prosecutor Betty Kennedy confident that the considerable evidence, though mostly circumstantial, was strong enough to result in a quick conviction. In his opening statement, defense attorney George Porter told the jury that George Michael Gwaltney was the victim of a frame-up, possibly by someone in his own department. Someone stopped Miss Bishop, as he would show, but it was not George Gwaltney. The defense produced a key witness, railroad worker Dennis Gubler, who testified that he had passed Robin Bishop's empty car on the highway shoulder that night. A light-colored car was parked 50 feet behind it. 
Gubler described to the jury a man carrying a flashlight who was approaching Bishop's car. His description, however, seemed to eliminate Wole as the man he saw. Other suspects, Porter contended, must be considered. The prosecution constructed a precise and elaborate timeline for the jury, from Robin's final phone call to her mother in Barstow to Gwaltney's radio call reporting the discovery of her body. The timeline included all of Gwaltney's known actions and time for the murder as well. The prosecution believed its case was bulletproof. Travel times, the pickup of the Olsen boy, the deputy sighting, the radio calls, everything. But Gwaltney's attorney countered by producing dozens of witnesses, CHP colleagues and personal friends who testified to his impeccable character and record. He used the timeline itself to cast doubt on the series of events. Could Gwaltney possibly have had enough time, barely 20 minutes, to do all he was accused of? The defense easily challenged the scientific analysis of the semen samples from the car and the victim. The technology for using DNA in the courtroom was still six years in the future. In addition, Porter was able to cast doubt on the prosecution's inconclusive tool mark analysis of the gun frame and tools taken from Gwaltney's vehicle and residence. Nevertheless, the prosecution believed the bullet evidence and the dismantled gun frame would be enough to convince the jury. The strongest uh, evidence that we had in the particular case was the frame of the gun. How can you explain the frame? How can you explain why it was in the vehicle? Why was it taken apart? Why was the barrel missing? Why was the cylinder missing? The grips, the hammer, the trigger? Why? It's mere Gwaltney was prepared and polished, providing the defense with its best witness, himself. He had an answer for everything that was questioned to him. And every answer he had was feasible. And what their defense tactic was, was to put a small amount of doubt into each one of the items of evidence that we presented. And that's what they did. And George did an excellent job of tying up all the loose ends when he testified. In the end, the testimony of 50 witnesses in 30 areas of expertise and all the accumulated evidence failed to convince the local jury. After four days, a deadlock was declared, 8-4 in favor of acquittal. George Gwaltney was a free man. Nothing is, as some people say, a slam dunk. And uh, you never know which way the jury's going to go. You never know which, which evidence the judge is going to let in and which evidence the judge won't let in. So because I wasn't involved in the daily routine, I was very much surprised that George was not found guilty. We spoke to a number of the jurors. And a few of the jurors thought there was a good possibility George was the one responsible but they couldn't believe he actually did it. And if he did do it, he was a highway patrolman, he worked hard, he worked for the community, uh, he was respected. We just couldn't find him guilty. Still believing George Gwaltney was guilty, prosecutors were determined to get a conviction. Less than one year after the mistrial, Gwaltney was tried again in Superior Court. But with little new evidence presented, the trial ended in another deadlock jury, 7-5, in favor of acquittal. George Gwaltney walked away, seemingly out of reach of the law. I was stunned. I sat around for several hours just thinking about it, rehashing. What could have we done to change the outcome? What could we do if and when there's another trial? Therefore, Arguing the appearance of harassment, of the judge crime. denied prosecutors a third trial. It appeared that George Gwaltney could not be brought to justice in the town of Barstow. We felt, and I was convinced, that George killed this lady and that we needed someone to come in and prosecute George. George needed to pay for what happened. From the moment of Gwaltney's arrest, the FBI had been watching this case with great interest. 
Any time a homicide involving a police officer takes place, the FBI monitors the investigation. After Gwaltney was acquitted a second time, there was enormous public pressure to find the truth surrounding Robin Bishop's murder. The FBI's Los Angeles field office decided it was time to intervene. The FBI knew that George Gwaltney would never be tried again for Robin Bishop's murder in the state of California. But in a federal court, he could be charged with violating her civil rights. By killing Robin Bishop while he was on duty, George Gwaltney had committed a federal crime. By taking her life, he had violated her civil rights. This had never been argued in a criminal trial before. But the FBI and federal prosecutors believed the Bishop murder was a perfect test case. The case was assigned to Special Agent Michael Randolph. Gwaltney was like a wolf in the sheep pen. The local law enforcement didn't know that he was the perpetrator. He was the person that had committed the murder. So he would stay one step ahead of them, destroying evidence. And this is a significant reason that the locals were unsuccessful in their prosecution. They didn't realize what they were dealing with. Exhaustively reviewing the crime scene photographs, Agent Randolph's attention was caught by a photo. It revealed the contents of the trunk of Gwaltney's patrol car the night of the murder. In it, he spotted a small box of ammunition. He sent the photos off for enlargement and analysis. We were notified by the FBI laboratory that photographic analysis uh, revealed that that was a box of 357 Magnum am ammunition and was, in fact, illegal ammo of the type that Gwaltney had testified he did not carry and was not carrying the night of the murder. It was also, we believe, the same box of ammo that was collected from his house. Agent Randolph had just caught George Gwaltney in his first lie. We knew that he had lied about one thing at the two local trials. There had to be other things that he had lied about. Working closely with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department and the California Highway Patrol, Agent Randolph began re-examining virtually all of the evidence from the first two state trials. Instead of handling it as a usual criminal investigation, we, we took an exhaustive approach, sort of like a TWA uh, Flight 800 approach. Every rivet had to be looked at, every rock had to be looked at. The mountain of reports, transcripts, photos, and physical evidence would be painstakingly re-examined by the FBI labs and bureau field agents. Key things that were used that we sent back to the lab would include such things as, obviously, the frame of the gun. The frame of the gun had been recovered by the local police, and they had done tool mark analysis, but had been unable to show who took the gun apart. The gun frame was sent back to the firearms tool mark unit of the FBI labs in Washington. Unique in the world, the lab has a collection of over 2,000 guns, from John Dillinger's pistol to the newest military assault rifle. Every bullet manufactured for the last 50 years is here too. Hollow point and steel jacket, 22 to 50 caliber. Like the guns, they're all here for testing and comparison. The soundproof ballistic room allows for comparison firing and bullet retrieval. Comparative microscopes allow for precise analysis of the gun barrels. But the most valuable asset in the lab are the agents whose long experience in these specialized tests make them invaluable in difficult cases such as the Bishop murder. Jim Cadigan at the FBI Firearms and Toolmark Unit was brought into the case to conduct a toolmark analysis of the gun frame and the 15 different wrenches and tools, including the pipe vise, taken from Gordney's home. Steel tools almost always leave behind some distinctive and often microscopic mark after their use, a signature as unique as a fingerprint. The FBI tool mark lab is one of the largest, most specialized, and most technologically sophisticated in the country. It was obvious from the beginning that the individual that had worked on this particular firearm knew something about forensics because he had removed several pieces 
of the uh, firearm that could be of some use later on to a forensic examiner. Agent Cadigan approached the very specific task of associating the tool marks on the gun frame with the tool marks made by the 15 gripping tools taken from the Gwaltney home. The question was, could one of these tools have been used to hold the frame while the barrel of the firearm was being removed? In looking at the frame, I noticed near where the, um, the hole was for the pin that locks the barrel down, very near the hole for that, there was a small uh, 16th of an inch impression, almost uh, as if it was made by a small screwdriver tip right below that hole. This tiny mark matched a small imperfection in one of Gwaltney's tools. In looking at the tools that were submitted from Gwaltney, I noticed that one of those tools, a pipe wrench, had a broken tooth and the tooth was broken off on, in the middle and then there was a small island of metal uh, left on the tooth and that looked very similar to the mark that was on the frame. So using that as a pivot point, I started making impressions with that tool and comparing those impressions uh, under a microscope, the tool marks, with the uh, impressions that were on the frame and was able to come to a conclusion that that particular tool was used to the exclusion of any other tool to make the marks that were found on the frame. In addition to the tool marks testing, the FBI lab conducted extensive testing on the particular bullets found in the Gwaltney home. The lack of a barrel on Gwaltney's gun made a ballistics test impossible, a problem that had hurt the prosecution in the state trials. So the FBI lab devised a test that had never before been used forensically, a radical new use of nuclear technology in forensic science. When a manufacturer of lead like Remington Arms makes a batch of lead, they throw things in much as you would when you're making meatloaf. That makes each batch of lead unique. We then took over 200 rounds that the locals had collected when they did their investigation of George Michael Gwaltney. We submitted those to the lab. The lab made those radioactive and got their molecular weight, their chemical fingerprint, and lo and behold, we find approximately 27 rounds that are the exact match as the lead taken from the head of our victim. The samples in the reactor absorb neutrons and become radioactive. This radioactivity is measured and gives a precise reading of the chemical elements in the lead from the bullet, an atomic fingerprint. The radioactive tests were indisputable. Each of the 27 bullets found in Gwaltney's closet, bullets he had sworn under oath he did not own, had come from the same batch of lead as the bullet that killed Robin Bishop. The FBI lab worked to establish a definite match between Gwaltney's gun frame and his pipe wrench, and between the fatal bullet and the bullets found in his home. Additionally, Agent Randolph constructed psychological portraits of not only George Gwaltney, but Robin Bishop. It was important that the federal jury perceive her as a genuine victim. Robin Bishop was raped by someone she was taught to respect and trust, an officer of the law. This made it very easy to understand the lack of force of violence that was evident in the crime scene other than the, the trauma. And, uh, she was compliant. She respected law enforcement authority. She's the type of person that pulled over and opened her wallet and handed her and stood out and was handcuffed even though she knew all she had done was a speeding ticket. It made her an easy victim. In the same way, the FBI examined every aspect of Gwaltney's background to gain an understanding of his behavior around women. By questioning a woman who admitted to having an affair with Gwaltney, it was learned that she would meet him at his regular spot along the isolated highway for sex. The same exit to the access road where he had taken Robin Bishop. Every woman who received a summons from Gwaltney in the last two years was contacted, and a pattern emerged. Nearly a dozen women claimed that Gwaltney had solicited them for sex or touched them suggestively. This indicated to us that this was not an isolated 
sexual assault with Mr. Gwaltney. This is a type of pattern of behavior. When he put his uniform on, he became predatory towards females, was, was our conclusion. Witness testimony from the state trials was also carefully re-examined for discrepancies that could lead to breaks in the case. In some instances, the FBI leaned hard with the weight of federal authority. Many witnesses were reluctant to testify, fearful. It's a small community, everybody knows everybody. We had to let them know that a federal investigation is just not a local matter that's going to blow away with the wind out in the desert. We're going to be here until this is resolved. This persistence led to one of the most crucial breakthroughs in the case. San Bernardino Sheriff's detectives had originally interviewed the owners of Barstow gun shops for signs that Gwaltney might have tried to buy a replacement barrel for his service revolver the day after the crime. None claimed to have seen him. One of those interviewed was a Mr. William Addington, owner of the Powderhorn Gun Shop. He had denied during both state trial investigations that George Gwaltney had been in his shop the day after the murder. But printouts from the shop's phone bills caught Addington in a lie. And we found toll records that show the day after the homicide, late in the afternoon, after the briefing that Gwaltney had attended, Mr. Addington had made a phone call up to this gun shop in Sacramento attempting to order a barrel for the type of weapon that Mr. Gwaltney carried that was now missing the barrel. Now confronted by the FBI with this evidence, Addington admitted that Gwaltney had been in his store trying to buy a barrel for his revolver the day after Robin Bishop's murder. Addington had previously lied to state investigators in an effort to avoid getting involved. Fearing that lying to the FBI was a felony, Addington broke down. Appreciate Reviewing the timeline of events, the FBI found that Gwaltney had created a false alibi to cover his visit to the gun shop and shoe repair shop where he'd had his holster cleaned and dyed, claiming to be on duty at the time. Gwaltney's story was falling apart. But the most important part of the timeline that the FBI reviewed was the pickup and delivery of the neighborhood boy, Preston Olson. The problem with that story was nobody had ever sat down with Preston Olson. He testified at two trials, and he verified what Gwaltney said. But as the FBI went over the events with Preston and his mother, minute by minute, they realized that Officer Gwaltney had actually left the boy's house a half hour earlier than his original testimony. Preston never owned a watch and had never timed it, and nobody had ever done a, a timeline analysis with him. This new information and the resulting revision of the timeline was one of the most important developments in the FBI's case. We didn't stop for anything. There was no traffic whatsoever. He can't change his story. He's locked himself in on two local trials to the local timeline. So the, the timeline was very significant. It gives him a half hour he has no explanation for. With the revised timeline, Officer Gwaltney now had ample time, 20 to 40 minutes, to stop Bishop, handcuff her, force her to have sex with him, then shoot her. Gwaltney knows she's got out-of-state plates, She's an attractive young blonde woman. He zips up the road, takes him a couple minutes, and then gives chase. Finally, Dr. Edward Blake of Forensic Science Associates was contacted to re-examine the semen evidence from the first two trials. Prior to the use of DNA in criminal trials, the use of semen as evidence was problematic. But the FBI felt there might still be a way to use what they had. Gwaltney had had a vasectomy and had it reversed. Was there any way this information could be used in the identification and matching of his semen with the crime scene specimens? Federal prosecutors asked Dr. Blake, a forensic serologist, if there were any new scientific developments that might help the investigation. He said, well, 
I mean, science does progress over time, does it not, Dr. Blake? I mean, maybe there's something, I and mean, would you be willing to just look into the matter? And I said, well, I happen to know some people that are involved in fertility work, and one of the elements that's involved in this case is uh, the idea that uh, Mr. Gwaltney had had a vasectomy and had it reversed. Dr. Blake learned from colleagues at the University of California that a vasectomy reversal can sometimes cause the production of anti-sperm antibodies. The body reacts to sperm seeping into the bloodstream as if it were invading germs. The phenomenon is highly unusual and could conceivably be used as a marker in seminal fluid. He sent samples from Gwaltney to the University of California lab. We found that not only do those fluids contain the anti-sperm antibodies, the antibodies were there at very, very high levels. And that provided the incentive to then uh, explore uh, the evidence itself. Dr. Blake learned of a new test used in fertility studies. It was called the immunobead assay test and could determine the presence of anti-sperm antibodies in the crime scene samples. Because this kind of evidence had never been used in court before, Dr. Blake videotaped the test to show the jury in the federal trial. Ultimately, uh, extracts that were prepared from uh, a pair of uh, genes uh, that were on Robin Bishop's body, uh, samples that were taken from the uh, highway patrol car seat uh, were prepared and these samples were tested for the presence of these anti-sperm antibodies. And in both of those samples, the anti-sperm antibodies uh, were found. During the six-month FBI investigation, all of the re-examined evidence and all of the new witness testimony led to one bedrock certainty for the special agents working on the case. We know we've got the right guy, and we're going to get him. George Gwaltney was going back to court. George Michael Gwaltney was indicted by a federal grand jury for violating the civil rights of Robin Bishop and arrested. He was the first California law officer to be charged under the federal civil rights statute. Once again, he pleaded not guilty. But for the first time since the ordeal began, Robin Bishop's parents had hopes for a different outcome. This time, George Gwaltney faced a federal court and the FBI. It was clear from the beginning that the federal trial would not be a repeat of the first two trials. The federal trial began on January 17, 1984, in the U.S. District Court in Los Angeles. George Gwaltney was represented by public defender Carol Douglas, who chose not to have his client testify. He knew George Gwaltney was in serious trouble. And then he subsequently murdered her. Gwaltney knew that we were breaking his alibis, breaking his stories, and that he was going to have to concoct a new story. He had painted himself into a corner, and we were going to use his brush to paint him into a jail cell. This is a frame -up. As the My trial progressed, the FBI no punched a hole in every that. strong point of Mere Gwaltney's earlier defense. The prosecution told the jury that Gwaltney had marked Robin Bishop as prey the first time he saw her in the fast food restaurant. With the testimony of the other women he had abused, Gwaltney's Officer of the Year image crumbled. After dropping Preston Olson at home, he pulled Bishop over and ordered her into his patrol car. The new testimony now gave him plenty of time. Following an established pattern, he drove to a familiar secluded spot and forced her into a sexual bargain, corroborated by the semen stain on the back seat of his new patrol car. As she sat struggling to put her boots back on, the blinding spotlight of Deputy Kaufman's patrol car hit Gwaltney, placing Gwaltney on the access road with Robin Bishop away from her car. Having no idea of who had seen him or what they had seen, he panicked and killed Robin Bishop. Then he breathlessly called the dispatcher with a possible suicide. The autopsy and the crime scene photos showed that he had not moved her head to check for a pulse. The movement was too great. 
He was desperately searching for the bullet that killed her, one in a series of actions in which he tried to cover up his crime. That night, Waltney roughly removed the barrel from the murder weapon, which left the microscopic tool mark fingerprints that matched the gun frame with Waltney's tools. But perhaps most damning in the courtroom was the controversial immunobead assay test. Videotape of tested samples from Robin's jeans and the car seat show the tiny beads attaching themselves to the sperm. What you can see in these videotapes for the appropriate specimens, that is specimens that contain the anti-sperm antibody, is the final stage of the analysis. Live sperm were shown swimming through the medium with the beads attached, indicating that the antibodies were present in both specimens. Dr. Blake was allowed by the judge only to indicate percentage results of his testing. He testified that Waltney's blood type put him in 12% of the population. Of that 12%, only 5% of those would test positive for the presence of anti-sperm antibodies. Less than 1% of the population could possibly have had sexual intercourse with Robin Bishop that night. As much as the defense might argue that the rest of the evidence was circumstantial, the scientific evidence was overpowering. The verdict was returned swiftly. When the jury walked in, um, they would not look at Gwaltney. And it was very clear that they had a guilty verdict. As far as I was concerned, I was pleased and that George had to suffer the consequences of his action and that Robin Bishop his death didn't go uninvestigated. It was, uh, it, it's a case you'll never forget. You took advantage of a vulnerable person. The judge gave George Gwaltney the, the stiffest possible sentence, a maximum federal prison term of 90 years, and a minimum term of 30 years before becoming eligible for parole. Mr. Gwaltney, you have Twelve years later, George Gwaltney died in prison of a heart attack. To the end, he claimed he was innocent, and had been the victim of a frame-up.